Welcome to Stereochemistry 4, Part 1. Let's look at how to name isomers with more than one asymmetric center. The R-S nomenclature of isomers with more than one asymmetric center are illustrated on this slide. Now we're going to use, for example, brackets, 2S, 3R brackets, in order to designate the stereochemistry at two separate asymmetric carbons in the same molecule. So this 2S is referring to one of these carbons and 3R is referring to the other. Now as it turns out in this particular compound of 3-bromo-2-butanol that this is number one carbon, number two, number three, and then number four. So two 3. So this 2s means that this is number 2 carbon has s configuration. Number 3 has r configuration. So we need to look at each of these asymmetric carbons separately in order to assign its, its configuration. The steps used to determine whether an asymmetric carbon has r or s configuration must be applied to each of the asymmetric carbons one at a time. All it takes is practice, so you must practice in order to be proficient at doing this. Let's take a look at the next slide. Okay, let's talk about how reactions can change configuration. Reactions of compounds that contain an asymmetric carbon are illustrated here. If a compound with an asymmetric carbon undergoes a reaction and the reaction does not break any of the four bonds to the asymmetric carbon, then the relative positions of the groups will not change and the configuration remains the same. Okay, that's illustrated right here. Here's our asymmetric carbon. It has one, two, three, four different groups bonded to it. We have a reaction. We're adding OH in the place of a chlorine. Notice, these four bonds are not affected at all. Therefore, the configuration of the product will be identical most often to the configuration of the reactant. The top reaction is S, one chloro, four methyl hexane reacting with OH to form S, four methyl, one hexanol. How do we know both of these structures have an S configuration? S, S, since no bonds to the asymmetric, asymmetric carbon are broken the reactant and product will have the same relative configuration. Okay, look at this example here. Here we have an asymmetric carbon. It's got these four bonds. We kind of look at it. Have the bonds been broken? Have they been changed? Now, as we look at this, one group has changed its form. There is a change in positions that we assign priority to. Notice we have hydrogenated this double bond. So which of these is the top priority group? When we start numbering these, we're going to see that this was one, this is two, three, four. This is now number one, two, three, four. So as a result, the configuration was S here, one, two, towards the left. Here we have R. So in the second reaction, one of the four groups bonded to the asymmetric carbon changes its form, but not its position. This results in a change in priorities, not the change in positions of the groups. As a result, the S reactant becomes an R product. The reactant is S-3-methylhexene, and the product is R-3-methylhexane. 
So we have to keep on the lookout for that sort of thing occurring. Okay, since glyceraldehyde, that's shown here on the slide, has one asymmetric carbon, it has two stereoisomers, R and S. Chemists found that it has both the R and S configuration as early as 1951. Many organic compounds were determined by synthesizing them from plus or minus glyceraldehyde. That is, their relative configurations were assumed to be the same as the configuration of glyceraldehyde that was used. So early on, R and S designation was relative to the plus or minus glyceraldehyde. Plus was called R and minus was called S. It turned out to be a 50-50% guess for glyceraldehyde configuration to be correct after absolute configuration was understood. So that's why sometimes you see the negative and the positive signs used. Okay, let's look at the resolution of a racemic mixture. Why can't enanomers be separated by the usual separation techniques such as fractional distillation or crystallization, crystallization that we use in the laboratory? They cannot because they have identical boiling points and solubility, solubilities which make them distill or crystallize at the same time. So we can't separate them easily. So the separation of enantiomers is called the resolution of erasmic mixture. Separating enantiomers by hand, like Louis Pasteur did it with tweezers, he did left-handed and right-handed crystals of sodium ammonium tartrate. Of course, this is not feasible for most people. Louis Pasteur was a very unusual person that could take tweezers and meticulously separate these minuscule crystals. So chemists have come up with methods that convert enantiomers into diastomers. See the flow chart on this slide and you'll see what I mean. Here are enantiomers and all of a sudden they're diastomers. As you can see, what's happened is we have made them salts. And as a result, they're now diastomers. No longer enantiomers. Now diastomers can be separated from each other because they have different physical properties. After they're separated, individual diastomers are converted back into their original enantiomer form, as you can see depicted in the slide. Treatment of acid returns them to their enantiomeric form, uh, and now they're separated. Uh, which is what we were after in the beginning. Here's R and here's S. They were together. Now we, are, we have been able to separate them from each other. So it's a very, tech, very uh, useful technique. Okay. They're not separated here and they're separated here because we've converted them to diastomers first. Okay, another technique of separation is known as chromatography. In addition to converting enantiomers into diastomers, chromatography can be used to separate enantiomers. Mixture to be separated is dissolved on a solvent and passed through a column packed with chiral material. The components of the mixture will go through with different rates because they have different affinities for the chiral material that's in the column. The chiral material is a chiral probe. Sometimes that term is used. So we can use chromatography to separate. Biological molecules can discriminate enantiomers. We have three definitions that are here. One is chiral catalyst. It's an enzyme that allows only one of the enantiomers to undergo a reaction. Now, what is an enzyme? It's a protein that catalyzes a chemical reaction. D-amino acid oxidase catalyzes only the reaction of the R enantiomer and leaves the S enantiomer unchanged. 
the reacted enantiomer can be easily separated from the unreacted enamelin enantiomer. So that's a chiral catalyst, an example of that. Chiral reagent. That reacts with one of the enantiomers but not the other. A chiral reagent does that. Chiral reagent is like a shoe, which is also chiral. It fits on only one foot. Okay, a chiral reagent reacts identically with both enantiomers, so it's often caused, called a chiral reagent. It's like a sock. A, an a chiral reagent is like a sock, which is also a chiral, and it fits on both feet. So these terms do come up now and then. As we've already seen earlier, discrimination of enantiomers by biological molecules occurs in the idea of receptors and binding sites of the receptor with enantiomers. A receptor is a protein that binds to a particular molecule. Because a receptor is chiral, it will bind one enantiomer better than the other, as you can see here. In this figure, a receptor binds the R enantiomer, but not the S enantiomer. Because it recognizes only one enantiomer, different physiological properties may be associated with each, with each enantiomer. In fact, that can be a way of taking advantage of different physiological properties. As you can see here, we have a fit in the binding site, perfect fit. When the uh, configuration changes to S, we no longer have a fit in these two locations, therefore there is no binding to the receptor, no physiological effect. Many drugs have asymmetric carbons and so have enantiomers. As you saw in an earlier lecture, thalidomide has one enantiomer that's teratogenic. Ibuprofen, by the way, an anesthesic, has an angesic effect, is mainly with the S plus enantiomer. Um, drug companies are trying to make products with just one enantiomer of, of ibuprofen, the one that bonds to the proper receptor as opposed to a racemic mixture is the type of, of drug we want to develop. Okay. Now, I mentioned earlier, there are atoms other, atoms other than carbon that can be asymmetric. Here we've got nitrogen, examples of nitrogen, phosphorus. So when nitrogen or phosphorus has four different groups or atoms attached to it, it has a tetrahedral geometry and it is a chirality center. A compound with a chirality center can exist as enantiomers. There are two pairs of enantiomers shown in this slide. Now this one is S. If we were to prioritize them, this would be one, this purple group. That would be uh, number two would be this ethyl group, and three would be the methyl group, and then four, the, the uh, proton. And going from one to two, we go towards the left. We're turning to the left, so it's S. <clears throat> the other enantiomer right here Here's number one, here's number two, we go this way, we're actually going towards the right. So it is R. This one is S, this one is R. Okay, here are some important questions about reactions, the stereochemistry of reactions. Two questions to consider. If a reaction can produce if a reaction product can exist as stereoisomers, does the reaction produce a single stereoisomer, a set of stereoisomers, or all possible stereoisomers? If stereoisomers are possible for the reactant, do all stereoisomers react to form the same stereoisometric product, or does each reactant form a different stereoisomer or a different set of stereoisomers? So let's look at some of these terms as we try to answer these questions in the next, uh, the next portion, and I'm going to end right now on this one.